is zero expansion and contraction longitudinally, which made this possible. Ooh. Because of the material? Yeah. Here's the historical context of this um, twitcher corrected relay, small scope, all spherical. Um, Dilworth is the first one to build a good sized relay scope. You must have seen it looked like a ray telescope around That's when he brought the yellow, right? That's when he brought it down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, I think he did bring it down. Yeah. He brought it a number of places. But it looked like a ray gun. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. The only problem with it is, is the following. It, in those days, you couldn't optically coat them well, so every time light goes through a piece of glass, the reason you can see the glass is because some light bounces off of it, about 10%. Okay, so he ended up losing about 40 to 50% of the light, and he had three recorrect the lenses. I have four. If I didn't have any coatings, I'd end up with just under 50% of the available light. So in effect, you're building a 32-inch and getting a 16-inch out of it. Not very good. The coatings are the only expensive part of the project since everything else was handmade. Uh, that cost about 5000 bucks, but places in Long Island could do them. And they're incredibly amazing coatings. If you put it slightly at an angle, it looks black right on, it just essentially disappears. You can look right through it. It doesn't look like there's anything in your hand. It's just an amazing effect. But by doing that, you only lose one half of one percent out of every surface. And that allows this to be built and not lose all the light. So in Newtonian, you get 92 percent times 92 percent. You get 80, 80 some, 84 percent of the available light. I'm getting 87 percent of the available light. So I'm actually beating a standing Newtonian in term, terms of the available light. And then Siegel brought it, went up all spherical, but it had double images. It wasn't, uh, didn't work very well. But he, Scott, was intrigued by these designs and spent literally 15 years playing with his computer, coming up with the perfect design. And that's basically what we built, his 15 years of effort. I'm not counting that in the construction process. <laughs> um, so the other thing I want to do, I do a lot of uh, AVSO work. I like to do uh, infrared imaging, so we made the, um, that's one of the reasons it was difficult to get the coatings, but I can go all the way down to 900 nanometers. Um, all spherical optics, central obstruction, the glass was, only, only the mangan was difficult to get, we had to get that glass from Germany. Uh, 46 millimeters, no vignetting. I don't understand. I'm, it's hard to understand what that means, except for the fact that on faint objects like the veil, okay, the veil <coughs> in my 32 inch and a half I was always impressed with it. Looks great. Um, you can see all the details and lines. You got to see the veil through a 32 inch of Lloyd socks on. First time I looked through the veil for the new one, I was just completely blown away. Not only could I see all that, but I could see little twigs coming off of it. If you think of a deep photograph of it, I can see it now. And I think it's because I'm getting full illumination as opposed to uh, non-full illumination. So it basically is like looking out in the desert and see the stars go over the horizon. That's what it looks like in the field of view, especially with the wide field. It's just completely flat and perfect images, no coma, no aberrations, edge to edge. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, anyways. <coughs> 546 <coughs> parts were needed. I have a lathe and a milling machine, so I got to work. Uh, Peter Bilo, I needed a big disc, and uh, Peter Bilo works for uh, iTech, and they were getting rid of a smaller uh, centrifuge table, because they were getting a big one. So this is a centrifuge table that they used to make the chips. This was made to spin at something like 10,000 RPM. It's balanced. Per That's why these little indents are in here. It's balanced within one brand from edge to edge. I got to turn one RP day, so. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> the advantage is it was perfectly machined. I didn't have to touch this thing, so that became my polar axle. Uh, it only he found out it cost iTech fifteen thousand bucks to make this thing, and it, it got tossed in my into wow. my lap. So here it is. Here's my polar axle. What's um, the diameter of that? Hmm? What's the diameter of that thing? This is 46 inches. Mm. <laughs> I just have to make it rigid now to withstand a telescope, right? So these are stainless steel, uh, which I turned. I managed to attach that on to a shaft, made it uh, so it's not as rigid. 
Uh, it sits on a Timken, okay, which I got. It's uh, cellophane, brand new. This is a double race Timken, five inches in diameter. Um, we looked it up. Uh, George East looked it up for me. He said it would run for roughly nine hundred bucks. Cellophane table, fifteen bucks. <laughs> <laughs> And everything else came from the junkyard. <laughs> I, I told you the expensive parts now. <laughs> um, the rest of them are just simple pillow blocks, which also got, came from stuff. Now this one, these two I had to buy. I couldn't find the right size. The others came from stuff. Uh, and basically just milled out the machines and just drilled holes and machined it in. And it works out fine. The only thing is it was concave. I thought there was going to be a disadvantage that I had to make a flat table to put the fork on. But in reality, that made it stiff, so it worked out perfectly fine. It's concave like this. Right. It's concave up. Thinking about the load bearing, it actually made it very stiff, so I'm actually happy that it had a concavity to it. Uh, so the, this I had to make out of steel because it's uh, had to be stiff for the fork arms. Attaching the central bar, fork arms, and here we are, painted. Optical layout. All right, so the spherical primary, 32 inches in diameter, the mangan secondary, which is concave this way, and that's 7.8 inches in diameter with perfect flat. The back is a uh, tenth wave. This came out to roughly 16th wave. Um, and again, this and this kind vary by more than 25,000. That gave me a lot of pauses when this was going to be possible until Paul came up with those. Uh, <laughs> Uh, carbon fiber struts. Everything has to go through a field stock, which is only 1.6 inches, and that's where the IP should go, actually. This would eliminate the, uh, the mangan is designed to eliminate the spherical aberration, mm -hmm. but because it's a lens, double lens, basically, it introduces color aberrations. These are designed to eliminate all the color aberrations and give you a flat field and eliminate all lateral color, and it actually worked. To my great surprise, I was a little, getting a little concerned toward the end there. What? That's the relay. That's this is the relay part. You're re-imaging the from here to here. In effect, it's a little telescope inside a big telescope. So oh, nice. it's taking the image and relaying it back here. But the reason for that is to eliminate color <coughs> aberration and to eliminate spherical aberration. Okay. What percentage? What percentage of the incoming light gets to the eyepiece? Uh, 87 percent, 86 percent. It loses 14 percent of light, but that's only by that half percent. That's only because the primary uh, is standard aluminum, okay, with overcoating. The secondary is actually silvered, so I'm getting 99.9 percent. .9%. Since it's a back surface, we could silver it and then coat it with copper and then paint over it, so that's permanent. Hmm. And then the coatings are all less than one half percent, so mm -hmm. the only light loss is the primary. It's just too much to try to coat that with. Uh, What's the definition of a mangan? A mangan? Yes. The, uh, ever looked at the Schutman up at uh, Stellafane? Mm -hmm. A Schutman uses a mangan. A mangan is unlike a front surface mirror where it flex off the surface like this does. It's going through the lens, mm -hmm. hits the back end, and then comes back through the lens again. So this acts as a double refracting lens and a flat all in one one piece. That's what a mangan is. It's a lens mirror combination. So here's the engineering diagram. Everything in green had to be made of uh, non-expansion materials and had to be perfectly stiff. It turns out if I'm off by, uh, what do you say, four, four thousandths either way I get lateral color, 25 thousandths this way I get axial color, and uh, uh, any deflection and you start getting coma. So the tolerances are incredibly tight. That's the one drawback of this design. You gotta come up with a design that this basically is fixed in space with relationship to that. These are not so important. Uh, if they're off by, not so important. Uh, Scott talks in terms of thousandth of an inch being not important, but it, it turns out these can be vary by a few thousandths and it's not so critical. But I made these out of carbon fiber anyway, so they're, they're fine. The real aberration is going to come if this varies from that. 